Please take your Bibles this morning and turn in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 17. If you'll find that in your Bibles this morning, Genesis chapter 17, verses 15 through 21. Um, as you're finding the passage this morning, I uh, just want to uh, add my uh, praise and thanks along with everything that we've been able to do this morning, uh, just to celebrate our families today, to give thanks for our moms today, and especially lift them up and to encourage them. Uh, very grateful that we've got something to give all of our ladies today when the worship service ends, and also thankful for Jessica McDonald and, and Carrie Gaddis for teaming up together on this, on this card. So make sure that you get one of these. Uh, ladies as you leave the worship service this morning. Uh, last Sunday, uh, I began a, a, ser a series of sermons with you where we want to profile uh, some of the great stories of these strong women of faith and action that we find in the Bible. And the overall uh, title of the series is Moms Who Move Mountains. Last week, we began with the first mom, right, Eve. Uh, Adam gave her her name, and the name Eve literally means giver of life. Well, this morning, we're going to look at Sarah, the wife of Abraham, mother of Isaac, wife of Abraham, and her name is Sarah. Take a look, Genesis 17, verses 15 through 21. Keep your Bibles open to Genesis 17 because there are some other passages having to do with Sarah's story that we're going to be looking at as well. But let's focus in, Genesis 17, 15 through 21. Please stand in honor of God's word, follow along as I read aloud. Genesis 17, beginning with verse 15. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. And then Abraham fell on his face, and he laughed, and he, and he said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. This morning as we take another look at stories of strong women of faith and action in the Bible, at moms who move mountains, it's great that we can do this on Mother's Day. On a day that we can give thanks for our moms, pray for moms, and together encourage our families and all of our ladies today. But I need to ask you a question. Who gets more attention on their special day? We've got Mother's Day today, and then in about a month or so, we'll, we'll celebrate Father's Day. But the question is, who gets more attention? Moms on Mother's Day or dads on Father's Day? Now, chances are you already know the answer to that question, the assumption that we all make. And, and just to confirm what we are already thinking, I want to share with you the results of a survey that took place within the last couple of years, just asking some questions about what people do to celebrate Mother's Day and then what people do to celebrate Father's Day. And here are the results. The number of people who celebrate Mother's Day, 84.5% of folks do that. The number of people who celebrate Father's Day, 76.1%. Dads, we're not starting out too well here. Uh, overall spending on Mother's Day, $19.9 billion. Overall spending on Father's Day, $12.5 billion. We're short there, about $7 billion, guys. Average spending per person in the U.S. for Mother's Day, $162.94. Average spending on Father's Day, $113.80. 
People who give a card to mom, 81.3%. People who give a card to dad, 64.1%. And it's not like we're unappreciative of all the things that people do for us on Father's Day, but let's just be real about where all the attention goes. But there's one category, dads, where we still come out ahead. And here was the question. Do you plan to give an apparel gift on Mother's Day? Do you plan to give an apparel gift? And, and from that survey, 33% said they plan to give an apparel gift on Mother's Day. 43% said they'll give an apparel di- a gift on Father's Day. So dads, let's just get ready for those ties because we know they're coming. And just be grateful for the one area where we do seem to get a little bit more attention. Last week we looked at Eve and saw that she moved mountains by being a life giver. Moms give life through relationships, grace, and the gospel. Today we're going to look at a mom who comes close to Eve in her impact on our lives even today. Her name is Sarah, the wife of Abraham and the mother of Isaac. She moved mountains because she lived by faith. Moms who move mountains live by faith. Now, what do I mean by faith? And I want to define faith in the same way that the Bible defines it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says this, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. The assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Moms who move mountains live by faith. If ever there was a phrase that was easier to say than to do, it is this idea of living by faith. We say those words so quickly and so easily. Well, we should all live by faith. Of course, we should all walk by faith and live by faith. But listen, living by faith is hard. Living by faith is difficult. It's one of the most challenging things that a person could ever be called to do. Because when you live by faith, you do it the way the Bible says. You've been promised some things that you don't have yet. But you are so sure and certain of the promise, you act as though you already have them even though you don't yet. And living by faith is is being certain of the things that you might even see from afar or being certain of a vision that God has given you, but you don't have it yet. But you act and live as though you've gotten it because you are so sure and certain that it's true. Living by faith. It can be easy to say, it it can be easy to sing about or even contemplate in a worship setting on a Mother's Day like this. But what about on a Monday morning or what about on a Friday evening when your trust in God is challenged or or what about when not if but when you struggle with difficulties in life obstacles to be overcome hurdles that have been placed in front of you and you're wondering God where are you why did this happen why did you let this happen was this part of your plan why God why In the midst of those types of questions and those types of struggles, can you still trust in God? And can you still believe in his goodness, believe in his promise? Living by faith is hard. But moms, I want to encourage you this morning and and encourage all of us today, as hard as it is to live by faith, it is not only the only way to live before God, but it's the way to move mountains and to have that kind of an impact on your world and in the lives of people around you. Jesus said, if we have faith as small as, small as a mustard seed, we're going to move mountains. Listen, if you've got faith, you're going to see that kind of impact in your life. The beautiful thing is, we've got a story before us in the life of Sarah that is just a, a gorgeous example of what it means to live by faith. When we think about the, the poster child for living by faith, we often think of Abraham. The, the man who was, who was called away from his home country, from his family, all that he was familiar with. And God said, Abraham, just start walking. I'm not even going to tell you where you're going. Just start walking and I'll tell you when to stop. Abraham had that kind of faith and trust in God. But I have, to, I have to be honest with you. When I think about this, I just think about Abraham. But I'm realizing, and God showed me this this week, that the whole time he had a partner. He had a life partner. Sarah, his wife, was right there with him. And so often the very words of promise and covenant that God gave to Abraham, he also gave to his wife Sarah. Some of the very same words. Abraham wasn't doing it alone. 
He had a partner. Abraham and Sarah together, husband and wife, a dad and a mom doing it together. So let's just see what Sarah has to show us today about a mom who moves mountains by her faith. The first thing I want to show you is this. Moms who move mountains get their identity from God. Moms, this is so important. Because how often do you struggle with just who you are and what you are supposed to do? Because there's the responsibility of being a caregiver, of being a, a financial advisor, of being an entrepreneur, of, of, of being a, 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 an emergency medical technician, of, of being a small business owner and transportation coordinator. And that's just for the stay-at-home moms. What about the moms? who have responsibility at home, and then those full-time jobs or careers torn in so many places, torn in so many directions. Just who am I and where should my priorities be? And we live in a culture with all sorts of expectations about who you should be and who you should aspire to be. And I just wonder how many, uh, le- how, how many women struggle with, with, with just a sense of, of, of resentment or guilt because they feel like they're just not measuring up in some other area. Where's your identity? And if we're not careful, our identity will be wrapped up in what we do. Our identity will be wrapped up in our accomplishments, the things that our children do or don't do, or or what we're able to to rack up in terms of, of, of stuff on the job. If we're not careful, that will be our identity. And we'll even place how we feel about ourselves based on how well we do. But Sarah shows us something here. We get our identity from God. It's all about a name change for her. And maybe you caught that in Genesis 17, beginning at verse 15. Because here, beginning at verse 15, Sarah gets a name change. Now, we talked before about how important names are in the Bible. We looked at that last week. God gave names to what he created. Abraham gave names to to, to living things. He even gave a name to his wife. But whenever a, a name is changed, so often it signifies that there has been a life change. Something significant has happened. And we even find this taking place for Abraham. Uh, if if you've got your spot there in Genesis 17, verse 15, back up to the first part of Genesis 17, because Abraham experiences a name change. Look at Genesis 17, verse 1, because there we find him referred to as Abram. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me, be blameless, that I might make my covenant between me and you and multiply you greatly. And then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Look at verse 5. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Abram means exalted father. Good name for a dad to have. Abraham means father of a multitude. And this is God's promise to Abraham. Abraham, you're the one. I'm going to reach the world through you. My covenant will be with you and through you, through your family and through the people that will come and the nation that will come from your family. I'm going to reach and redeem the world. All through you, Abraham. And God changes his name as a way to signify that. From exalted father to father of a multitude. But he does the same thing for his wife Sarai. We read it just a moment ago. Look at verse 15. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. The word Sarah, the name Sarah, literally means princess. So we've got princess married to father of a multitude. And understand this, this is where you get your identity from God. You let God tell you who you are. You let God tell you how valued you are, how worthy you are, how unconditionally loved you are. Because Sarah found out that day that she was a princess. Because that's what God told her. Sarah, you are princess. Verse 16, I will bless her. Moreover, I'll give you a son by her. I will bless her. She shall become nations. I love that. She shall become nations. And kings of people shall come from her. That's why she was called princess. 
because she would give birth to kings. This was a step of faith for Sarah to believe this because when God told Sarah this, she and Abraham as of yet had no children, much less a multitude, no children, no sons yet, no nation to behold. They were living in a tent. They were having to travel. They, they could look at their belongings in front of them. So much of this they didn't have yet. There were no kings around them that they could claim. But Sarah believed it. She took her identity and her worth from God. God says, I'm a princess. And so that's who I am. Listen, this is faith. This is being assured of a promise that God gave to her. This amazing promise that, gave, that God gave not just to Abraham, but to Abraham and Sarah. And together as life partners, they would carry out this amazing covenant promise that God gave to them. It's an amazing thing to think about. But it all started when one woman simply said, God, if you say I'm a princess, then I am a princess. Moms, get your identity from God. Whatever day you're having, whatever week you're having, and you, listen, some weeks can be great, some days can be awesome. Maybe even your day today has been so trying and challenging even to get here this morning. Just stop. Center your heart in the love of God. And look, let God say to you, you are my daughter. I created you. I love you with grace. I sent my son for you, and I'm redeeming you. I've forgiven all of your sins. You are loved. You are valued. And you are a princess. There may not be anything visibly to support that, but this is what God tells you. This is where you get your identity. And there's the basis for everything else. This is where your self-worth comes from. This is where your confidence comes from. This is where your grit comes from. Because you believe what God says about you in Jesus. Get your identity from God and from nobody else. And then here's something else. Moms who move mountains live by faith. Not only do you get your identity from God, but also, secondly, you wait on God. And here again, if, if there ever were a couple of words that were awfully easy to say but very hard to do, these three, wait on God. Because Sarah's story is not only a beautiful story of a woman who believed what God said about her, not only a woman of, of, of amazing faith along with her life partner Abraham, but also an example of what happens when we don't wait on God. Because you see, Sarah and Abraham, just like me and just like you, they could get very impatient. And they know what God promised. They know what God said he would do. And they believed him. But after a while, quite frankly, they got tired of waiting. And after a while, Sarah begins to say to Abraham, Abraham, maybe there's some things that we can do here. Maybe there are some actions that we can take that can kind of get this thing going because it just feels like everything has stalled out. Why don't we do some things to get it going? A fateful mistake. Because Sarah and Abraham chose not to wait on God. And you and I have been living with those consequences ever since. Let me show you exactly what I mean. This, this, this can sound strange to modern ears, but believe me, what Sarah proposed to Abraham was common in their day. It doesn't make it right, and it certainly doesn't make it anything that God would ever condone, but the actions that they took were desperate, but they were things that people did in their day. Basically, it's this. God had promised them a son. Years go by, still no son. Sarah says, Abraham, let's take matters into our own hand. Just as Eve grasped the fruit of, from, the knowledge, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil instead of waiting on God to give it, like we saw last week, Sarah knows that God has promised them a son. Years go by, no son. She says, Abraham, let's do something about this and get it going. Look at Genesis 16, verse 1. Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, even though God had promised it hadn't happened yet. Verse 1, she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And so after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Cana, 
Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong be done to me, that may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt, and may the Lord judge between you and me. But Abraham said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. And then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. When we take matters into our own hands, it never turns out right and it never has a good result take the example here they get impatient sarai says abram here's my maid servant i'll give her to you you go in you be intimate with her perhaps she'll conceive and that way we can have the son that god has promised but we just did it our way instead of waiting on god and so when hagar becomes pregnant bitterness anger Jealousy invade this home, and then when she gives birth and they call the, the, the little boy Ishmael, they throw her out of the house, and she's cast off into an unknown world completely on her own. This is wrong. What happened to Hagar was wrong. Now, understand this. God saw Hagar. God came to Hagar, and he blessed her with grace and with love. In fact, he said to Hagar, Hagar, don't fear. I will be with you. Your son Ishmael will become a great nation. But my covenant is with Sarah and Abraham and Isaac. Terrible thing that happened. And yet it's life. And, and God watches over this life and he preserves it. But I simply want to say to you, this is what happens. Faith means not only do we accept what God says, but faith also means that we wait on him and his timing. And even when we get impatient, we don't try to do things to try to get ahead of him. We wait on his timing. Because you see, because Sarah and Abraham and Hagar got impatient, Ishmael is born. And there's a whole group of people that would come from Ishmael. And today it's the Arab people that are descendants of Ishmael. And it's the Jewish people that are descendants of Isaac. And the strife and the enmity between those two people that have, that have riven our world apart can be traced all the way back to Sarah and Abraham and not waiting on God. Do you see what happens? It never, ever turns out right. So all of us, all of us today, if we're going to live by faith, not only do we accept what God says, but we've got to wait on him and on his timing. And Sarah is an example of the positives from this, but she's also an example of the negative as well. But then finally, moms who move mountains live by faith. It means Moms, that you find your joy in God. Sarai realized that even though she had stepped outside of God's will and she had done something that God did not want and was not God's will for her, she stepped outside and did it anyway. She realized that the grace of God forgave her. The covenant and the promise was still in place despite what Abraham and Sarah were trying to do to kind of get it jump-started. The covenant was still in place, but it would be God's timing and God's plan. So that indeed, Abraham and Isaac... I'm sorry, Abraham and Sarah would become intimate. They would come together, and Sarah would give birth to a son. It finally did happen, and I want you to see how all that came about. Look at Genesis 18, beginning at verse 1. Genesis 18, verse 1. God renews the promise, and I want you to see what happens. I love this, I love this story. Genesis 18, verse 1. The Lord appeared to him, that is to Abraham, by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, don't pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought. Wash your feet. Rest yourselves under the tree while I'll bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. And they said, 
do as you have said. Abraham quickly gets an elaborate meal together. He, he goes into Sarah and he says, quick, get some bed breaking, get, 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 get some bread baking. Let's go ahead and slay a calf. Let's serve this before our guest today. Verse eight, he took curds and milk and the calf that he prepared, set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Look at verse nine. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? He said, she's in the tent. And the Lord said in verse 10, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. You see, the promise is still there. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. Verse 12, so Sarah laughed to herself, and she said, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year. Sarah shall have a son. Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, Yes, you did laugh. Sarah can't believe this, and she laughs to herself. But look at Genesis 21, verse 1. Genesis 21, verse 1. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said. The Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Laughter spontaneous, free, overcome with that sense of wonder at what God has done. Sarah experiences this. In fact, it's so much so that she gives her son the name Isaac, and the name Isaac means laughter. And so every time she called Isaac in for a meal or called him to do his chores or in any way referred to him, she was always saying laughter as the reminder of the amazing and beautiful and intimate joy that she had found in God. Yes, he made her a promise, and yes, it came true exactly as God had said. Moms, you think about the things you're praying for, the things that you're laboring for, and it seems like God is waiting. Why is it taking so long for God to act and to move? Listen, you don't give up on God. Because when the prayer comes true, when your child does accept Christ or, or when your child finds his or her life partner or when you see blessings in the life of your husband or your family, when it finally does happen, and all you can do is laugh from joy. Don't be robbed of that by trying to get ahead of God. Find your joy in him. And that joy is there. Moms, be encouraged today. Not only are you faith givers like Eve, but you are faith livers like Sarah. Live by faith and you'll move mountains. You've got the hardest job in the world. There's no denying that. And our world is depending on you to do your job well. Get your identity from God and his promise for you. Wait on him for that promise to come true and find your joy in the Lord when the promise comes true. Moms, it all comes together through Jesus. In Jesus, we are chosen to be God's people in covenant relationship with him. Trust Jesus. Let him give you your identity. Let him help you wait upon the Lord and let him give you the deepest joy you could ever know. Families, it's our job to help them. Let's give our moms lots of love today. Call your mom today. Tell her that you love her and that you appreciate all that she's done for you. And if your mom has gone home to be with the Lord, make sure you take time today to thank the Lord for the gift of your mom. No mom is perfect, just as the story of Sarah before us today reinforces. But she's called to live by faith, and that's so much easier to do when there are others to do it with. 
Sarah had Abraham and Isaac. Your mom has you. So for all of us, the challenge to live by faith is for everyone. God has an amazing plan for you that fits perfectly into his purpose to redeem the world and to let his kingdom come. You can be a part of it today. Trust Jesus. Because in Jesus, you have forgiveness of sins and eternal peace with God. And if this sounds too good to be true, even laughable, remember Sarah and Abraham and how they both laughed at the goodness of God. He understands your amazement. He understands your amusement and even your doubt. He'll keep up the offer until you say yes, and then God's laughter and joy will fill your life. Father, we thank you this morning for Sarah, the princess, and what she shows us about living by faith, and how we can, we can see by her story that it is not easy to do this. We have others to help us. We have your power inside of us, and yet, Lord, at times we do stumble. And so, Father, today, bring us back into your circle of love. Bring us back into that close relationship with you through Jesus. Jesus knew the love of a mother. Jesus made sure his mother was taken care of before he breathed his last. And, Father, may we see our moms as your gift in our lives today. And for all of us, may we take the hand of Christ, trust him, and live by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.